Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. So if you're wondering, no, I am not Pastor Mike with the tan. My name is Pastor Josh. I am the executive pastor here as well as the youth pastor. And I want to talk about the youth for a little bit because we are coming off the back of our teen campout, which was a huge success for us. This teen campout, we had 116 students. Come on out. Yes, it was very powerful. 116 students, they got to go to the water park. They got to um, have a powerful encounter with God at the night service. They got to drive me crazy at 3 a.m., making noises out of their tents, like, whoop, whoop. I was like, stop with the noises. I had a bullhorn making all these noises. It was a fun time, and we could not have done it without the generosity of this church. So give it up for yourselves for the generosity. We spent five weeks fundraising. We had a goal that we wanted to meet. It was a big goal. I didn't know if we could meet that goal. You guys crushed that goal in three weeks of giving. So thank you so much for helping us to pull that event off. We also had 10 students give their lives to Christ at that camp out. And then today, we have 16, now this is no small thing, 16 teenagers getting water baptized because their lives were changed at that event. So it was very, very powerful. So the title of our teen campout was Trial by Fire. We're in a series here called Ghosted. So today, I'm going to do a mix of the two, like a trial by ghosted or ghosted by fire, something along those lines. And we've been talking all about this person known as the Holy Spirit. Say that with me. Say the Holy Holy Spirit. Spirit. And one thing that I love most about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit dwells on the inside of every believer. If Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you. Say this with me. Say, the Holy Spirit Spirit lives in me. Last month, we did a series on the Holy Spirit and the teens in the youth ministry, and we talked about our friend Bill Nye, the science guy, and we looked at this thing called mitochondria, and the teens all knew this phrase. If you know it, help me finish it. It is... Mitochondria is the powerhouse of the, of the cells. You guys have seen Bill Nye before. Good. And we talked about if mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, the Holy Spirit is the powerhouse of the Christian. Look at how the Holy Spirit empowers us to do what we were created to do. And that was a great message, but you're not going to get it today. Sorry. You are going to get the message from our camp out, though, which I think is even better. So today, I want us to focus on this idea, like I said, that the Spirit of God dwells on the inside of us. And I want to share a scripture that makes that clear. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says this, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? You. So where does God's spirit live? Exactly. The spirit of God lives in us. And before I want to talk more about the spirit of God and how he dwells on the inside of us, I want to share a story with you. But this story is from my college years. Everybody say, "Uh uh-oh. Because when you hear a college story, you are like, oh, no, ain't he a pastor? Here we go. I drove all the way out in this rain just to hear this foolishness. Yes, it is a college story, and I want to share this idea. We'll, we'll break it down in a little bit. So when I was in college, I went to UAlbany, and I was in a dorm room with five people, or four of us. It was five total, including me. 
And the way that the room was set up was there was three rooms, three people to the left. I was in that room, a common area, and a room to the right. So my, um, my roommates, they love to fill the room with smoke. Now, this was not the, oh my goodness, Jesus is here type of smoke. <laughs> this was not the haze machine during praise and worship as we sang with an acoustic guitar type of smoke. This was the haze that Pastor Mike called the purple haze for a service. That sort of haze. So one day, my roommates, they were all in the right room. I was in the left room. They were creating that haze that they were so skillful at creating this cloud. And I was sitting on my room, I'm sitting in my room, I was using my computer, and then I hear on the door, and I go, well, this ain't good, because according to my calculations, they's making the haze right now. So I hear it again, loud knock. So I slip off, and I'll sit on my bed. I slip off my bed, I tiptoe to the door, and I look through the peephole, and looking back at me are two police officers. And then my roommates are behind me, they're like, who is it? I'm like, the police. They're like, what do we do? So me being a good Christian, I'm like, we got to hide the stuff. Start hiding everything. <laughs> there was alcohol. There was drugs. There was all sorts of stuff that did not belong in that room. So I'm running around hiding. I'm like, just keep hiding. And I get the brilliant idea. I say, let me hide some of the stuff underneath my bed. <laughs> Great idea, right? Somebody say, uh-oh. So I hide the stuff. I open the door. The police officer says, can we come in? He wasn't asking. He was coming in anyways. He walks into the room, and then he tells all of us, sit on your beds and do not move. So I go, and I sit on my bed, and there's a closet next to my bed, and now I'm sitting there like, oh, boy. They tell us they're going to search the room, and they reiterate over and over again, do not move. So we're sitting there, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. The police officer's across the room, and he turns, and he looks at me first. And he starts walking towards me. Boom. 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 He wasn't actually walking in slow motion, but it's cooler that way. Boom. Boom. And I'm like, well, I did this to myself. I'm done. And he goes, and he searches the closet right next to me. So I'm like, he's taking stuff out of the closet. We, we were bad at hiding stuff, quite honestly. And he's taking all this stuff out the closet. And then he looks at me, and I'm like, well... I wasn't doing anything, but I guess I'm done now. And he looks at me, and he goes, and he searches my roommate's bed, which is across the room. So I'm sitting on my bed, and I'm like this. And I kid you not, this is my conversation with God. I'm sitting on my bed, and I'm like, all right, Lord, I'm going to get up now. I'm going to move everything from underneath my bed to the closet. So, Lord, please blind the eyes of this police officer. That's my quote. And don't let him turn around. So I sneak off my bed. And I grab some of this stuff. Trip number one. I'm just, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper. Trip number two, a light in the darkness. Trip number three, my God, hey. Trip number four, pray to the Holy Ghost. Four trips to and from my bed. I'm sitting there. He doesn't turn around. He comes over to search my side now. I'm like, did you check that back corner, officer? Look good. Nothing in there. So I put myself into this bad situation. I get away scot-free. I'm like, all right. I got lucky. I got lucky that time. You think I learned my lesson, right? Yeah. Somebody say, uh-oh. <laughs> Second time. A few months ago, so I'm a pastor and everything, right? I roll up on the scene of a car accident. This girl's airbag bruised her face pretty bad. She's crying. There's a bunch of people just standing there looking at her, like, help homegirl out. She's crying. She says her organs are hurting. I go to her. I'm like, hey, sit down. She keeps trying to get up. She has this hat in her hand. I'm like, are you okay? She's like, yeah, but I got drugs in this hat. I was like, ooh. I've been here before. I ain't trying to do that again. She's like, I got drugs in my hat. Police arrive on the scene. Ambulance is there. As the ambulance is taking care of her, police start looking around her car. They suspect something's up. So now they're giving this girl a field sobriety test, that impossible task of walking in a straight line. 
that like no one can do anyways. And she's walking, she has to walk in this straight line. She takes her hat. She says, hey, can you hold my hat? You would think I go, arrest her in the name of Jesus. She has illegal substances. That's not what I did. I said, sure. And now I'm holding these drugs in my hand knowing that she told me there's drugs in here the second time. Police officer goes, hey, I need to check that bag. I'm like, here you go. He finds it. He goes, bingo. I'm like, okay, bingo. What's his name? Oh, what's that got to do with me? He comes over. He's like, how'd you know that girl? Why are you upset that she's getting arrested? You don't know her? I'm like, no. He's like, there was drugs in her hand. I was like, what? <laughs> oh, my gosh. I need to go wash my hands. That is horrible. Second time, I put myself into a situation that I did not need to put myself in. Second time, I could have been rightfully punished for my actions. Second time, I was making these bonehead mistakes. And I want to ask you, church, where was the Holy Spirit when I was making these bonehead mistakes? He was with me. Where was the Holy Spirit when I was making these mistakes? He was right with me. According to the passage that we read at first, if we are God's temple and God's, temp and God's spirit is dwelling on the inside of us, then God's spirit was with me. The spirit of God did not abandon me because I was doing something that I shouldn't have been doing. The spirit of God isn't only with me on the mountaintops, he's also with me in the valleys that I put myself into. The Spirit of God is not only with me when I'm doing the right things. The Spirit of God is with me always. And if you're here today and you think that God's presence leaves you, that the Spirit of God leaves you when you make mistakes, I want you to know that that is a lie because God will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible says that when we are faithless, that God is faithful. This is a promise to us that he keeps with himself as the standard. Because when God is making covenants with us, we can mess up our side. But his side will never be messed up. And another thing is, if God staying with me is based upon my ability, then guess when God's not going to be with me? A lot of the time. Because I'm going to fail and fail, and fail, and fail. But because of God's goodness, and his graciousness, and his mercy, his mercies are new, and new, and new, and new, and new, every single morning. God does not abandon us based upon our mistakes. That is a lie. And that leads me to my first point today. That the Holy Spirit does not abandon you based upon your behavior. He stays with you based upon his goodness. I'm going to read that again. The Holy Spirit does not abandon you based upon your behavior. He stays with you based upon his goodness. Isn't it amazing that we serve a God that's with us in the good times and the bad times? That would never abandon us even if we try to abandon him. There's three boys in the, fire, in the Bible that encountered a literal trial by fire. That was the name of our camp. And their names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three boys served under a king named Nebuchadnezzar. Everyone say Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. That takes like four minutes to say. So instead of saying Nebuchadnezzar, I'm going to say, for all my VeggieTales fans, Mr. Nezzar. Mr. Nezzar, Okay. If you don't know what VeggieTales is, it's Christian talking vegetables, and it's a kid show, and I actually loved it growing up, and I still love the theme song to this day. So this king, Mr. Nezer, he created a statue, and he said that everyone, when they hear the music start to play, they had to bow down and worship the statue. Now, that's fine for most people in that kingdom, but these three boys were servants of the one true God. And they knew that they weren't supposed to have any other gods or idols or statues before the one true God. So they weren't going to bow down and worship this thing, this idol that the king told them to worship. So the music would start to play. 
And everybody would bow down and begin to worship this idol, and these three boys wouldn't. They refused to do what everybody else was doing. And as these boys were doing what was right and not bowing down to this idol, the Bible says that some astrologers went to the king and they complained. And if you ask me, they have what I'm calling the Karen spirit. <laughs> These astrologers asked to speak to the manager, and they said, um, excuse me, um, Mr. Nezer, um, it says here on the sign that when the music plays, they're supposed to bow down and worship. Those three boys, they ain't doing it. But yep, mm-hmm, yep, blue jeans, yep, red baseball cap. They're not bowing down. And these three boys are now being accused, which they were, of not following the rules that Nebuchadnezzar had established. And at this moment, these boys come face to face with the king for refusing to bow down. Watch what happens. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 12, it says, There are some Jews who you set over the affairs, so these boys were leaders, and they pay no attention to you. Your majesty, they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold that you set up. King's not happy. It says, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Mr. Nezer said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you don't serve my gods, that you don't worship the image of gold? And these boys, in their life, things begin to heat up. Things begin to get a little bit intense. Now, I started this message by sharing two stories of fires that I had put myself in. And I think we can understand being in a fire when we make a mistake, because I earned that. I deserved that. I put myself in that situation. I was doing wrong. But in this story, we see that these boys aren't in the fire for doing what was wrong, but they're in the fire and going through a trial for doing what was right. So what's my point today? Don't let somebody tell you that you're outside of God's will because there's troubles in your life. Don't let somebody tell you that you're living in sin or you're making mistakes or God's punishing you because there's difficulties in this life. Because these boys were in the fire not because they were running away from God. They ended up in the fire because they were running to God. And sometimes the fires that we see in this life aren't an indication that we're running away from God. It's an indication that we're not bowing to the idols that everybody else is bowing to and we're following the one true God. So these boys are walking and they walk and they're face to face with this king who's now putting on the pressure. He's trying to get them to bow. Sometimes the people around you will try to get you to bow and they'll try to get you to do something that's contrary to what God is speaking to you. And the question is in this story and in all of our lives, what do you do when the world is telling you to bow down? Watch what these three gangsters do, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They replied to the king. Now imagine replying to the president of the United States, but 10 times more. These kings ran everything. It was kill them, kill them, kill them. I want your wife, I want your wife, I want your wife. Give me all, anything that I wanted. These kings were tyrants. These boys stand up to this tyrant, and they say, King Nezer, we don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Kind of like Jesus when he was getting accused. He said, Pilate, I don't need to defend myself from you. But watch what they say in verse 17. They say, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve, the God we serve, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. The God we serve. When I read that passage at first, I was like, why didn't they just say our God? Why not just say God? As I thought about it, I realized that there's a difference in our hearts and in our minds between God and the God whom we serve. Because when you're serving God and you're serving, 
your actions are in alignment with your belief. And when your actions are in alignment with your belief, it doesn't matter the size of the king that's standing in front of you because your actions and your convictions tell you, I am not serving you because I serve the one true God. So I want to ask you today, where are you serving? Where are you serving? There is opportunities to serve all around us. We have opportunities to serve God in the way that we love people around us. We have a bunch of kids running around having fun, learning about the goodness of God from the time they're babies. We have tons of opportunities to serve today. I want to ask you, where are you serving? Watch what happens in verse 18. These boys say, but even if God doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, the first thing that I love about this passage, in this passage at whole, is that these boys are confronted with a king that is trying to kill them. A king that is leading them, in the, trying to lead them in the wrong direction. A king that is not for them, a king that is against them, but they still refer to him as your majesty. These boys still honor somebody that is set out on destroying them. And I don't know who this is for. It is a powerful thing when you honor somebody that feels like they don't deserve it. It's a powerful thing to honor your parents even when they've done you wrong. Honor doesn't say what they did to me was okay. Honor says, in my heart, I'm going to give you the honor that's due to you based upon your position. All right, I don't want to keep going off on this. But the king, when he hears this, that they tell him to his face, we're not going to worship it, he gets mad. King goes, oh, word, you ain't going to bow down? I, I got something for you. Watch this. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. And he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the blazing furnace. And as I was reading this passage, I thought to myself, why would you tie up somebody before throwing them into a fire? Why would you tie up somebody when they're going to burn up in the fire anyways? The reason that you tie up somebody is not so that they cook evenly and you can make a good jerky out of them. <laughs> the reason you tie up somebody is to remind them that they're powerless. The reason why you tie up somebody is to remind them that they hold no say in this matter. They hold no power in this matter. And somebody in here knows the feeling of being tied up. Yeah. Somebody in here knows the feeling of being powerless. Somebody knows the feeling of being tied up by shame. Somebody knows the feeling of being tied up with depression. Somebody in here has been bound up by fear. Somebody in here is wearing a rope called unforgiveness. Many of us here today know the feeling of being bound and feeling powerless. And maybe you feel right now that you're powerless. Like you're running around, you're trying your best to serve God, but at the end of the day, you wake up bound and you go to sleep bound. Maybe you're trying with all your strength to get these ropes off. If I could just get this rope off, but all of your strength isn't enough to free you from being bound. And for some of you, the reality is that this rope is so tight it's not just something that you wear. It's now a part of who you are. It's not, I have fear. It's, I am afraid. I am. It's a statement we use before we say our names. I am afraid. I am broken. I am worthless. I am fearful. And these ropes that are squeezing us, 
They feel like there's no way to get them off in our own strength. And the reality is there might not be a way to get it off in your own strength. But I know a guy that can. I know a guy that can help you get out of the squeeze. These boys are at the point where if God doesn't come through, they're done for. And if you're here at the point where if God doesn't come through, you're done for, watch this. Daniel chapter 3, verse 22. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers, remember the strongest soldiers, who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Some of you walk through fires that are so hot that it kills the people around you. And if anybody else was to go through that, they'd be dead. But the fact that you're in church today, the fact that you're still breathing, is a testimony that God's not done with you yet. That God still has a plan for your life. Verse 23, these three men, firmly tied or completely powerless, they fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement, and he asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound, unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. He said, look, I see a church in Middletown, New York, going to hear God's word in the middle of a hurricane, unbound, unharmed, and it appears that the Holy Spirit is with them in the middle of that fire. This king who was set on destroying these three boys, this king who was set on killing them and forcing them to bow is the same king that witnessed three boys that encountered freedom in the fire. I want you to know today, as Christians, God has not called us to merely survive the fire. He has not called us to just crawl through the fire. And this is my first point today. As Christians, we can experience freedom in the fire. Say that with me. Say freedom, freedom. In, in the fire. the fire. Because whom the Son has set free yeah. is truly free indeed. Yeah. Isn't it so ironic how God works? That the same fire that was designed to destroy them seven times hotter was the same fire that burned the things that were holding them down. The very same fire that was designed to destroy them is the very same thing that God used as an instrument to set them free from their bondage. What's my point today? Those things that have been holding you down, those things that have stopped you in the past, those things that you can't shake off in your own strength, the fire that you're going into is not going to burn you. That fire is going to set you free. How is that possible? As a Christian, how is it possible that I can experience freedom in the fire? It's simple. It goes back to ghosted. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is is freedom. As modern day followers of Christ, in any circumstance, I need you to know where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, I started this message by all of us saying together that the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us, right? And then 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17 says that the Lord is Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, if the Spirit of God lives on the inside of me, 
And where God's spirit is, there is freedom. That means that wherever I walk, I'm walking in freedom. It means when I walk into the fire, I'm walking in freedom. It means if we're tied up with chains, that we're tied up in freedom. The reality is the only thing that we're bound to as Christians is freedom itself. Because the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us. Now watch this. In the book of Acts, there's two guys named Paul and Silas. And these guys were beaten up, and they were bloodied, and they were put into chains. But in the midst of their chains, they began to worship God. That's freedom. And in the midst of worshiping God, freedom on the inside, guess what happened? The chains fell off of them. Some of you need to worship while that chain is still on you because your worship will cause those chains to fall right off. As Christians, hear me out. If you're saying, once my situations change, then I'll encounter freedom, you've got it backwards. If you're waiting for your life to change to say, now I am free, you've got it backwards. Christianity is not when my life changes, then I am free. It is because I am free, my life is going to change. Because freedom lives on the inside of me, it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter the storms or the fires. I know that where I walk, I walk in freedom. And what I love about this story is that the freedom encountered was not just for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because there is a king that thought he was equal to God. And that king leapt to his feet in amazement of the power of the one true God. And that king went and made a decree. He said, oops. He said, anybody that goes against their God, we're throwing them into the furnace. Now, I don't think he should have been just killing people. He was, he was a little extra. But the reality is, because these boys were free in the fire, he got to see who the one true God is. And those things that are set out to destroy us, God will use them to set others free. 2,000 years ago, there was this guy named Jesus that walked the earth. He was fully God, and he was fully man. And he was put into a fire for doing what was right. There was this thing called the cross that was designed to destroy him. And this cross that was designed to destroy Jesus was the end of a long journey, of a lot of pain. He was whipped, he was punched, he was mocked, he was spit on, and then he had to carry that cross up a hill. And he was so weak that he couldn't even carry that cross. And at the end of this long trip up to this place named Golgotha, the cross that he carried, the thing that was meant to destroy him, was the very same cross that God used to set everybody in this room free. The things that the devil means for evil, God can and will use it not only to set us free, but to set other people free. What happened on that cross? The sin problem was taken away. Something that Adam started in the garden was finished at the cross. The same cross that was trying to destroy the Son of God was the same cross that made me a son of God. It made me a child of God. Those things that are set to destroy us, God will use to set us free. And maybe you're here today, and as I'm talking about Jesus setting us free and the power of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, and you're saying, I don't know this God. I don't know this Jesus that you're talking about. It's my first time to church. Uh, I was just coming with a friend to check it out. If that's you today, and you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer with us. And what this prayer is, is us declaring with our mouths that Jesus Christ is our personal Lord and Savior. And we all pray it together, and it goes like this. It goes, dear God, dear God come to you today, come to you today. Just, like I am. just like I am. I believe 
that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose again for me. Come into my heart, come into my life to change me and to make me new. I will serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time today, we want to do something real quick. We don't want to embarrass you. We want to celebrate you. If you prayed that for the first time today, can you wave at me real quick? If there's anybody in the room, see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Can we give it up for nine people that made a decision to follow Jesus today? If you're one of those people that made that decision for the very first time, I want to encourage you to stop at, at our Welcome Center. We have a book that we'd love to give for, to you to help you with your next steps on this journey with Christ. You have made the best decision you could have possibly made today. Before we close out, we will also have a prayer team at the front at the end. If you feel in your heart that you're not quite done here yet, you need prayer for something, we would love to pray with you as well. And this Saturday, everybody say this Saturday. This Saturday, this Saturday is our prayer meeting. You want to be there. If I was an annoying salesman in the mall, I'd be like, excuse me, miss. Have you ever been to a prayer meeting that would change your life forever? Yes, yes, just, just put your email right there. Yes, yes, I, I, don't tell anybody. I'm gonna take 30 cents off for you, just for you, because you're so kind. I want to sell this prayer meeting to you. It is going to be a powerful time in God's presence. What time is that, is that nine? 9 a.m., I wanna see everybody there, all right? Let's pray before we head out. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you that you're with, in, with us in the midst of every fire. Lord, I thank you that as a church that we're kept safe, that our families are kept safe, that our properties are kept safe in the middle of this bad weather. Lord, I thank you today that we're being led by your spirit and that everything we set our hands to would prosper and be successful. We thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.